So today we're going to be looking at Galatians chapter 3, just the first nine verses. And uh, today's message is the hearing of God. Paul's going to mention it two times, the hearing of God. And, you know, the Lord wants us to hear him, doesn't he? He wants us to hear his voice. In fact, when the Lord, the Last Supper, when he was talking to his disciples, he said, I no longer call you servants because a servant doesn't know what his master is doing, but I call you friends because I tell you everything my father is doing. The Lord wants to, uh, to tell us what's happening, what's happening in heaven. We're seated with him in the heavenlies, what's happening down here, and really how to connect the two things, right? The two places. And so the Lord really wants us to hear his voice so we can hear his will, walk out his will for our lives, and be able to prove the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. Amen. So let's pray. Lord, we thank you that you are here. Lord, we thank you that uh, you have a special message for each one of us, because all of us, especially me, want to hear a new word from you this morning. When we leave here, you've given us a message that we can act upon. So we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. And so when the Lord speaks to us, you know, he uses his word. How many times have you read the same passage? And you've read it 20, 30, 40 times. Suddenly you read it, and it just triggered exactly something new that's going on in your life, a new perspective, and it's suddenly brand new. And it's like, I've read that so many times. Suddenly it's new. It's not new. There's nothing new under the sun, right? You've read that before, but it means something new for you today. So he speaks through his word. He speaks through others and he speaks through our spirit. You know, his spirit speaks to our spirit. It's amazing. You know, he equipped us with, with audible, physical hearing so we can hear things. In fact, I have a little diagram of the ears and the brain and how, you know, the sound waves go into our, our ear canal and uh, hit the, the uh, eardrum and the, and the sensations travel up the, uh, what is it, the audible nerve? Audible nerve, something like that. And, uh, and anyway, trigger, trigger messages to the brain. So he has this whole elaborate system so that we can hear on earth, right? Hear everything around us. But when he speaks to our spirit, he speaks into our spirit. He doesn't even need all that equipment. Isn't it amazing? He could just speak to your spirit. I just love that about God. You ever been driving down the road and like absolutely nothing's going on suddenly? I'll receive that, Lord. Thank you for that. It's like, wait a minute, whoa, where did that come from? You know? Or you're suddenly driving around the road and you're all of a sudden just are moved to tears or moved to laughter, whatever it is, because his spirit is speaking to your spirit. Remember when he said in John 10, he said, My sheep know my voice, and he's leading us out to green pastures. You know, we we know when it's his voice. We might hear other voices, but suddenly we hear, no, that was a vo- that was a word from the Lord. And I love this in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9. And it says, I has not seen nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed them to us through his spirit. For the spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. Don't you love that? You know, it's like suddenly that's why the Lord can speak to you in a whole new intimate way when you get saved and you receive his Holy Spirit. You see the world in a whole different way, don't you? It means everything. It's just it's, it's entirely different because you're walking in the newness of life. So let's dig in. We're going to look at Galatians chapter 3. And if you can recall, Paul is writing to the church of Galatia, and when he's writing to them, he had shared with them the simplicity of Jesus Christ, that the the crucifixion of Christ, he paid for your sins on the cross, and it is finished, right? It's completely done. And then behind him, whenever he'd leave each town, suddenly the Judaizers, the religious people, would come behind him and say, yes, some of what he said was accurate, okay, but a lot wasn't. Let me fill in all the blanks, okay? 
You know, Jesus, yeah, he was a good man, or some of them believed he wasn't even God, whatever. They, but then they'd add to it, but you still have to be circumcised. You still have to follow all the festivals. You still have to follow the Judaic law, the Mosaic law. You have to do all these things to measure up still, because what Christ did, in essence, wasn't good enough. Remember that equation we had up last week? Jesus plus nothing is everything, right? And everything minus Jesus is nothing. So apart from Christ, it means nothing. Everything we have is nothing, you know? And so they would try to add on to what, what Paul was preaching. And so he was constantly battling this religious spirit that was trying to infiltrate. So let's pick it up in verse 1. O oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth? before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed. This bewitched, it's a funny word to see in the Bible, isn't it? You think of that old show for us old people used to watch the, the witch, the bewitched. Anyway, um, but bewitched is to manipulate, to coerce, to corrupt, to persuade, to seduce, all that kind of thing. But who has seduced you into another way of thinking rather than Christ portrayed, the crucifixion of Christ portrayed? And you know, how did Paul portray? This word portray really means to like paint a picture. It comes from the word portrait. It's like, how was the crucifixion of Christ painted? How did he paint that picture for the Galatians? We have a map up here. This was the first missions journey of Paul. And we see Galatia. And you know, Galatia is about 700 miles all the way down to the right, the right bottom corner of Jerusalem. Probably many of the people he was writing to never even made it to Jerusalem, ever. The chances of them ever meeting Jesus or actually being there for the crucifixion was probably zero or close to it, right? It's unlikely Paul even saw the crucifixion of Jesus. In fact, perhaps some theologians say maybe he bumped into him once or twice in Jerusalem because Paul was always in Jerusalem and Jesus always created an uproar in the town right when he showed up. But Paul never talks about that, except that one time he says, you know, we no longer judge Christ according to the flesh, but that can mean a lot of things. So we don't even know Paul ever saw him, but he probably wasn't at the crucifixion, right? He wasn't there. How did he paint a picture of something he never experienced? But we know that Jesus appeared to him on the way to Damascus and changed his life. But how did Jesus, I mean, how did Paul paint that picture of a crucified Christ? because he saw Stephen there, stoned to death at his approval and oversight. And when he saw Stephen stoned to death, I believe that left a mark on his heart. Suddenly when Jesus appeared to him, it is me who you are persecuting, suddenly the memory of Stephen came rushing back to him and thinking, wow, that was an innocent man. He wasn't against God. He was for God. And I approved of his stoning. In fact, not only that, but I went and captured other Christians and dragged them into the courts so that they would also get persecuted and tried and tortured and whatever else happened to them. I was responsible for that. Suddenly, he understood the crucifixion of Christ because he was part of it. And so Paul knew about the crucifixion of Christ, even if he didn't personally witness it, because he spoke about it. Remember last week he said, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live in faith to the Lord Jesus, to my Savior, the Son of God, you know? So he spoke about, I was crucified with Christ. He now understood it. He spoke about it. But not only that, but he demonstrated it. Remember last week we showed how he was always defending his, his Gentile brothers, saying they don't, need to get, they don't need to do anything else. They have Jesus, and that's all they need. But not only that, but he actually experienced the crucifixion of Christ. And he demonstrated that for up to this point, 15 years of complete persecution. This guy had been through everything. I mean, could you imagine five times getting scourged, 39 times striking you with a whip, with bones and whatever? I mean, ripping apart your flesh. 39 of those strokes, five different times. Three times getting beaten with a rod. 
three times being shipwrecked, one and a half days out on the sea, being stoned to death. I believe in Ephesus he was dead, and he rose back up because, you know, he talks about deaths often. How many times did he die? But the Lord just brought him back. To, no, it's not time yet, Paul. You've got to per be persecuted even more. You need to suffer more for my name's sake. He lived the persecuted life, didn't he? That's how he painted a picture. And you know, when I was thinking about that, I'm wondering, how do we paint a picture of the crucifixion of Christ? Like, how does your life demonstrate the crucifixion of Christ? You know, when you're wrong to forgive, sometimes we think we have the right not to forgive. And then you think about what Paul went through, and even more importantly, what Jesus went through. And I don't have the, I have the right not to forgive? Like, that's just like... That's like number, that's like 101, crucifixion, right? Forgiving and giving of ourselves to others and also loving our enemies. You know, it's easy to love people who don't like you. How about loving your enemies? I mean, that's portraying the crucifixion of Christ. When we say, yeah, I know how you treat me, but I am going to treat you better because Christ loves you. It's not about what I think. It's about what he thinks. And I want to think the way he thinks. We have the mind of Christ, you know. And so he portrayed the crucifixion of Christ to them. And he's saying, who is conning you away from the simplicity of just dying to the old and rising in the new? So let's read on. Verse 2. This only I want to learn from you. Did you receive the spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Are you so foolish Having begun in the spirit, are you now being made perfect by the flesh? Have you suffered so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? And if you can recall early on, these people would say, you need to be circumcised, you need to follow these laws, your hair isn't right, this isn't right, that isn't right. You know, I suddenly thought of a joke. Never mind. Um, but it, I'll tell it, what the heck. So, okay, so anyway... So this guy comes into a church, okay, and he comes in and he's, he's dressed kind of casual, but he's in a very hoity-toity high-end church, you know, and they all look at him. And he comes down, and he sits right in the front, and they're all looking at him and like, you know, what's with that guy? Doesn't, you know, he's a... And so they're all looking over at him, and then somebody comes over at the church, and he goes, listen, why don't you go home and pray about how you should dress? You know, just kind of take a look around and, you know, just ask God. What, what's, what should you dress like when you come to church? So he, he goes home, and he comes back dressed the same way. Uh, did you do it? Did you, did you pray and ask God how you should dress? And, I, and he said, I did. And God said, I don't know. I've never been there. <laughs> never mind. Anyway. Ooh. <laughs> Ouchie. But you know the point. But <laughs> anyway. But back to, I hate when I suddenly have those pop-ups, you know. But, um. But he said, having begun in the spirit, are you now being made perfect in the flesh? Have you suffered so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? In other words, you put up with all them tormenting you to change your hair, change this, change that. And you kept fighting, and now you're surrendering. You're saying now it's Jesus plus something else is going to get me saved. It's going to make me better. It's going to make me perfect. Jesus and something else. I believe we are purified in hope but purified, right, when we actually live the gospel. You know, you can learn the gospel, but when you start being a doer of the word, that's purification, isn't it? That's like all of a sudden you are the living word, in a sense, to so many people. That's purity, isn't it? That's how we become perfect and, and rising to the stature of Jesus, when you start being doers of the word, not dressing a certain way or all these superficial things. So anyway, he's really upset with these Galatians because they're changing the simplicity of Jesus. And verse 5, Therefore, he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you, does he do it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Again, the second time, hearing of faith. You know, what is this hearing of faith? You know, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God, right? Right? We, we can't even have faith, really, that the Lord wants us to have until we audibly hear the Word of God. We actually hear. Now, there's some people that hear the Word of God through dreams. 
In fact, uh, Danny didn't even get into that, but he, he'll share, you know, in, in all that's happening in the Muslim country because there's no one spreading the gospel audibly. So they have to, God has to resort to dreams for them. They have to dream about meeting Jesus. So then when finally somebody comes along and starts telling them about it, he says, you know, I kind of, I met him in a dream, you know? And so they know through that method. But really, we have to hear audibly, but then when we believe, we start hearing through faith. Isn't that great when you start hearing through faith? We can both hear the same thing. And I can hear the same thing that an unbeliever hears and come away with completely different messages, right? Because I know what God says about that situation, and they don't. I'm hearing in the spirit. I'm hearing by faith. They're hearing by the audible, worldly way, right? And so the Lord really wants us to, to learn from him in this way, through faith. I love this scripture, um, Hebrews 5, 14. It says, but solid food belongs to those who are of full age. That is, those who, rants, who reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. In other words, by doing the Word of God, you get strength in it, and you can really determine what's true and what's false. I just want to bring something up. You know, we as a church, you know, we, we don't uh, promote ministry. Sometimes we partner with ministries like InterCP and YWAM and other. You know, we have partnerships, alliances because of our common goals. But by and large, we would not promote a ministry that's outside of this because you can't possibly know everything about them. And someone came to me recently and asked, actually, uh, would we support something? And I said, well, we really don't know much about their finances and this and that. We really need to learn that before we just jump right in. And they agreed. They said, yeah, actually, that's, that's true. You know? So we don't always promote things, even on the Internet, even on movements in the Christian culture. We don't promote them, but we also don't denounce them. You know, because if they're preaching Jesus, it might be a different method. It might look different. But we, you know, we're called not to judge another one's servant, you know. And to start pointing fingers. Sometimes, actually, Christians turn the swords on each other. Did you ever see that? You know, we have the same sword, right? And all of a sudden, instead of fighting the true enemy, we start fighting each other. Because we have the better perspective of Scripture than they do. Let's fight and let's duke this out, right? And in a way, that's not, I don't believe what we're called to. Now, if somebody sees or reads something that they say, I don't know if that lines up with Scripture. The best thing I heard at the East Coast Pastors Conference, uh, the uh, Calvary Chapel East Coast Pastors Conference, said, if you, uh, if you have questions or hear rumors about a ministry, listen to the f five full sermons, the last five full sermons, from beginning to end, off their website, not filtered through YouTube or some other, you know, filter, and r listen to the whole thing and determine, is this of God or is it not? Are they promoting Jesus Christ as the Son of God, the only way, truth, and life? And determine it that way, rather than hearing through someone else's words, hearing through gossip, hearing through this, hearing through that, you know? Um, in fact, I'll just give a quick example. I had heard, like, President Trump stopped in a church, uh, David Platt's church. I'll just say this because I don't see anything wrong. You know, I would never slander another minister. And, and I had heard, oh, and David Platt, he, he, uh, he apologized to his church for praying over, over President Trump. And I'm like, like, he's pretty solid. Really? Like, did he apologize? So I went online. I checked. He didn't apologize. He just made it clear. He made it clear that by him praying for our leaders, which we're told to do in Scripture, he's not taking sides, he's not telling people vote for him, he's just supporting our leaders. That's what he did. That's godly. That's biblical. You know? But if I had heard and believed whoever told me that, and I fall into it sometimes, you just hear something, hey, I heard this, and all of a sudden, there I am, joining in with the stabbing of my own brother, right? Because I'm not doing, being a Berean and investigating it Fully. And I just say that because there's a lot of things going on right now. And I think it's because there's a great awakening happening. And the church of God is rising up. And what better way does the devil have to weaken us but to turn us against ourselves? 
right? Isn't that what he wants to do? Weaken us. We start not trusting each other. We start thinking this one's preaching heresy, that one's preaching heresy. That's weird. That's not how we do it. That's this, that's that. And I just think it can really get out of control and become paranoia. And is God all about fear? No. Perfect love casts out fear. We're to fear him, but perfect love for our brothers and sisters, it casts out fear. We see the unity of the gospel. Amen? In fact, I love this ministry. I'm getting way off, but inner CP, because ever since we've been in it, we've been all around, you know, many parts of the world with inner CP, and you meet churches from all different countries, and all you see is, I see Jesus. It smells like Jesus in here. The fragrance of Christ is in this place. I love this place. I love Jesus, you know, and it's beautiful when you can just accept the variety of Jesus and embrace it and say, you know, Jesus looks a lot of different ways in a lot of different places. I can remember we were in Nicaragua. I'm going way off track, sorry. But we were in Nicaragua, and it was so awesome because we were at this service, and it was so crazy and joy-filled that people were running around in circles around. It became like this, like, uh, party. And it was during this great celebration of a service in Nicaragua. I think, I wish we could do that back home, but not right now, you know. Because, you know, it's just not the culture up there. But it is down there, and it's to be celebrated. It's, it's a fun, it's beautiful. We should have fun serving God. I believe that. I mean, is God all about saying, you remember you did that back then? You remember you did that back then? No, he's like, that's all been washed away. You are brand new. Let's have fun. Let's celebrate salvation, amen? It's a good time being saved. Are you having a good time being a believer? If you're not then you're believing something from the past. You're hearing another message. Another voice is still speaking to you from the past, condemning you. Because the voice of God is saying, come on, me, we got living to do. We got some loving to do. We got some celebration ahead. It's time to rejoice. Amen. Hallelujah. You know, I mean, the old is gone and the new. It's, we're walking in the newness of life. It's beautiful. Anyway, let's move on. We're almost done. Anyway. Therefore, he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you, does he do it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Just as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness, therefore, know that only those who are of faith are sons of Abraham. And the Scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel to Abraham beforehand, saying, In you all the nations shall be blessed. So when those who are of faith are blessed, those who are of faith are blessed with believing Abraham. You know, what is, why does he suddenly talk about Abraham? Because people would come along, the religious people, and say, Paul is okay, but you got to look back to Abraham. I mean, he's the father of our faith. You got to follow what him. You got to be circumcised. Abraham was cir circumcised. He circumcised even Elijah, uh, he, not Elisha, uh, Ishmael. He, he sacrificed everyone, all his servants. Everybody was sac uh, circumcised. You got to be circumcised. You got to follow all these rules, regulations. But this happened before circumcision ever was. When Abraham believed God and it was accredited to him as righteousness. What did he believe? Not to be circumcised. He believed when God said, look up at the stars. Can you count them? Absolutely not. And that's how many descendants you are going to have. More than the stars in the sky. And Abraham said, really? Okay, I believe it. That was the faith of Abraham, before the law ever came along, Abraham believed God. He didn't need the law to believe God. He already believed God. Circumcision, we don't have time to get into it. It was a whole different thing, a whole different purpose, you know? And so he was saying, you know, true followers of God have the faith of Abraham. But they don't follow Abraham. They follow Jesus Christ. You know, as a Calvary Chapel, we're very proud of belonging to a heritage of Calvary Chapels. If you read the Calvary Distinctives, it really lays out what Calvary Chapels, how they by and large operate. They're all very different, but they believe in teaching the Word of God through and through. And so do we. 
but it allows for unique differences when it comes to just methods and styles, things like that. But by and large, we love how Chuck Smith served God. But we don't follow Chuck Smith. We follow Jesus Christ. It's about Jesus. It's not about Chuck Smith. This just happens to be a, 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 an affiliation that supports how we follow Jesus Christ. Amen? And so we're going to finish up soon, but I just want to touch on a few things. You know, this idea of the hearing of faith, this hearing of faith, like, are you hearing God? Do you hear him calling to you? You know, it's easy to point out scripture and you say, wow, that's beautiful. Like, remember when Samuel was serving in the tabernacle and Eli, the high priest, was in, in real sin because of his uh, permissive, uh, permissive nature with his kids, allowing them to sin. We don't have time to get into that, but he was, they were sinning greatly in the t- house of God. He was allowing it. He was overlooking it. He was permitting it and not throwing his kids out of the tabernacle. And so he was permitting this sin to permeate in the tabernacle. So there was no one righteous enough to hear from God, and Eli certainly wasn't, and especially his sons. And so do you remember the Lord came to Samuel and said, Samuel, and he says, here I am, and he gets up, he runs to Eli, you called me, what's up? And he says, no, I didn't call you, go back to bed. Two more times, what's up? And finally, Eli said, wait a minute, this is God. Go back and says, speak, your servant is listening. And so he went back, and that fourth time, Samuel, Samuel, second time he says, and he says, yes, speak, for your your servant is listening. And then he begins to speak through Samuel. And from that point on, Samuel was the voice of God. In fact, all Israel knew this is God speaking, and they would not allow a word the Lord would not allow one word of Samuel's to fall to the ground. That's how significant every word. It's like, you know, they would just, listen. Samuel's going to speak. We got to listen. This is the voice of God. And I just want to say, if you haven't heard the Lord for a while, maybe you're assuming it's other things calling you. Maybe you're listening to other things and assuming, well, he's not talking to me personally. But perhaps he's calling to you in a still small voice, in a whatever type of voice he's speaking to you, but he's speaking to you to say, you know, I have a significant plan for you. And it's a plan, of course, to prosper you, not to harm you, but it is a unique plan that only you can carry out. Because, you know, he wants to speak to each one of us uniquely because he has a unique plan for each one of us. It might be partnered with someone else, but it's still unique. And it's wonderful to say, Lord, start speaking to me, please. I haven't heard your voice in a long time. And just, Lord, I just want to hear from you. Please speak to me. You know, David, when he was, when he was just meditating on the Lord, he said, you know, look at this palace I live in. This isn't fair. This isn't right. You know, look at the Lord's living in this tent. I got to build God a house. And so he went and told Nathan, listen, I have to build a house for God. And Nathan said, do whatever your heart tells you to do. But then the Lord came to Nathan and he spoke to Nathan because David wasn't hearing directly from God. He used to, but he wasn't then. But Nathan was given a message for David that David, you're not the man to build my temple, but your son will be. I will set up forever kingdom through your son. And of course, Jesus came through that lineage. But the point is, David got an impression that he needs to build a house. And maybe it wasn't for him, but it was still in his heart to build that temple for God. And when I was thinking about that, I was thinking about a long time ago, that uh, when I got saved, and I was into music back before I got saved, I was in like a, a bar band, you know. And so uh, we weren't so great, but we played a lot. You know? <laughs> so anyway, but then when I got saved, I started writing Christian music. I started just loving, loving God through music, you know. And so we, this, we got this band together. We were traveling around to different coffee houses. We had a blast, you know. And, but over time, you could just almost sense, I don't know if God is, you know, we started to go in places and we felt less and less relevant. Do you know what I'm saying? 
And in fact, one time I remember we were at this school and there's a bunch of young people there and we're playing and our stuff, because we were in our, I guess, late 30s then, so our stuff was a little antiquated for them. And then every time we would go off, I'd hear this, rawr, 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 rawr. Like it was screamo. Do you remember screamo music? It was like, rawr, 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 rawr. I'm like, what is this? This sounds like hell would sound. <laughs> but it was Christian music somehow, right? But it was like nasty and gnarly. I'm thinking, no wonder they don't like us. They like that, right? But anyway, so I think it was that night, actually. So I'm going home. I'm glad that stuff's out of style now. Kind of. If you like it, I'm sorry. I apologize. But anyway, but I remember driving home and just feeling like a little empty. And it was like probably midnight. And I just started like thinking, you know, it's late. It wasn't such a great show. I suddenly started thinking, why am I doing this? Like, is it for God anymore or is it for me? Because I like write music. I like singing. I like, like, what is the point of this? But quitting got me a little sad, you know, because this is like, and all of a sudden, I thought of a little boy at home with his red fender playing the guitar. And God told me, I could hear his voice almost clear as day. It's time to invest elsewhere. It's time to invest elsewhere. And I remember going home, I'm like, then I'm done. We're done. That's okay. And so my son, Jesse, I forget, how old were you back then? <laughs> you were a little kid. And uh, by the way, my son, Jesse, and his wonderful wife, Maria, is here from Nashville today. But I just remember saying, it's time. Just start writing with Jesse. And we would be up on, like, we went snowboarding, we were up on ski lifts. Remember that song you wrote that goes like this? Da, 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 you know? And we would just start writing together. It was so beautiful, working with him and investing in him. And we had such a great time. And over time, he started singing, too. And, just, and then before you knew it, he was leading worship at our church and for children's ministry and all these things. And then the other kids started jumping in, too, and they started getting involved and and just all of a sudden, I'm thinking, man, I am so much happier than trying to make something happen in a coffee house that ain't happening no more. You know, I know that ain't the right way to say that. But because God is moving on, but I was still part of his plan. I'm still hearing his voice. It's just a different message now. It's investing in a new temple being built, right? It's investing in something new. And the Lord always wants to lead us to something new, doesn't he? He's always speaking something new. He's always speaking to us saying, I have something special for you to do. Are you ready to stop listening to the old voices? I got a new message for you. Are you listening? Because there's something new for you that you're about to do. And really, that's what he wants to do. You know, hearing that message, you know, Elijah heard God's voice. After that drought of three and a half years, he goes, when you appear before Ahab, when you go before him, I will bring the rain. And you remember, he heard the voice of God, and he goes before Ahab, and after he calls down fire, and it burns up the sacrifice, and he massacres the 450 prophets of Baal. That didn't seem to fit, but it happened. I mean, uh, it doesn't fit right now. I mean, you know, it kind of breaks the... But it happened, and, and after that, he says, go eat and drink, because I hear the sound of rain. There wasn't no rain, but he heard the rain. Why did he hear it? Because God told him rain's going to be coming. You know, we have to hear with faith. Faith has its own set of ears. Do you know that? And when you heard it from God, you could just keep listening. I hear it. The rain's coming. And you know the story. He went belt and knelt down, and he kept saying, do you see any rain yet? Do you see any rain yet? Seven times, and finally that cloud rose up. You know, that's believing and then waiting for it to happen because you know what you heard, because you heard with faith. Amen? We're almost done. As the worship team comes forward, just a couple more things. There's such great examples. When God brought Israel out of Egypt and for 40 years, you know, the story traveled through the wilderness and as they traveled, he kept demonstrating 
amazing miracles. I mean, like pillars of fire, pillars of cloud. He would, you know, send forth manna from on high, bring water out of rocks, decimate their attackers, you know, all these things, right? And he was showing them all these wonderful things, but they still weren't getting it. They weren't realizing what's actually happening because they weren't seeing what the eyes are supposed to see or hearing with the words they are supposed to hear. And so, in Deuteronomy, if you have that verse 29, after 40 years in the wilderness, they're about to go into the promised land. And he said, you know, to this point, I have not given you a heart that you would perceive or eyes to see or ears to hear. You, you, you're not comprehending what's happening here. And then he says, but those things which are revealed, the secret things belong to the Lord our God. But those things which are revealed belong to us and to our children forever that they may do all the words of this law. He said to them, you haven't seen it to this point, but now you're going to see it because you're stepping in to the promised land. You're going to start hearing the way you're supposed to hear. You're going to start seeing the way you're supposed to see. Because before you had the old mindset of being slaves in Egypt, the past, you were hearing the voices of make more bricks, build more, work, work, work. You know, you don't deserve, who your God is weak. What are you doing here for 400 years, you losers? They were hearing the voices of slaves being slaves. But the Lord is saying, you know, that generation died. It's time to step into the new, the promised land. Because when you step into the promised land, you will hear with new ears, see with new eyes, and your heart will perceive what I'm trying to show you. And I think all of us are meant to step into new things, aren't you? Are you tired of listening to the old voices telling you you aren't worthy of that you failed in the past you're going to fail again you know you 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 the sins they're still haunting you no they're not he said it is finished it is completely finished it's time to step in what is new and hear with new ears see with new eyes and perceive with your heart with your heart remember when he told Ezekiel when the when Israel was in in exile he said to e Ezekiel speak to these dry bones and when you speak to them prophesy over them that life will be brought back into their lungs and he spoke to them and suddenly the the bones started rattling and the flesh started building and the breath started breathing and this army was rising up and he said, so I will bring my army Israel back into their homeland. And he's saying to all of us, hear with a new voice. Hear with faith. Not, don't hear what you hear in this world. Hear from heaven. Hear from the Lord himself saying, I have a new plan for you. I want you to walk into new things with new power to work new miracles in your life. Amen. Because we're not meant to be trapped in the old things. We're always supposed to be being renewed again and again and again and again. It doesn't matter how old we are. It doesn't matter how much we've failed in the past. We are always new. And we're, think of this. We're always one step closer to glory. Isn't that awesome? It only gets better for every believer. The future is only bright for every believer. There's only better times coming our way. No matter what your past was, there's always a brighter future. Isn't that awesome to know that? You know, I was thinking about this church that we're buying. And you know what's amazing? The hearing of faith. When we were about to start at this facility, a different facility or a church, they told us we couldn't. It's not zoned for that. And we had already planned a Christmas meal and all these things. And we're like, what are we going to do? It's, it's weeks away. And we don't, we're not meeting. And we can't have church there or anything. And so the Lord put in my mind, Pastor Amanda, Holy Trinity Episcopal Church. She was a nice lady. And I just called her and I said, can we come over and talk to you about 
maybe having a Christmas meal. And I'm telling you, before we ever got there, I said, she's going to let us have church there. When we tell her, us, her our story, she's going to let us have church there. And sure enough, we start telling her our stories of woe about how we can't have the Christmas meal. And starting January, we have no church location. And this is supposed to be something that the Lord's in and we don't know what to do. And suddenly she said, you can have church here. And so we started church there for about three months until finally the timing didn't work and we moved on to Grace Christian Church. But we always stayed in contact with them, just helping them with things and had a couple more Christmas meals with them. But one time they said when the pastor left, they had no pastor at all. And they said, why don't you help us with these things? Because we don't have anyone to share the word of God. Isn't that sad? A whole church. And no one knew the word of God. I'm just telling the truth here. And so we started helping out with different things. But then, this has all been aligned directly to where we're at right now. Because I called the guy we served with. And I said, I heard you're closing your doors. In tears, he's telling me, yeah, it's, it's over. I'm like, well, it doesn't have to be. Can we move in there? And he said, well, let's give it a try. And so over the process of the last month and a half, the Lord has just opened up doors and enabled us to buy this property that probably would have been torn down and turned into condos or houses. And now the Lord is going to visit it again, just like he did way back when they were building that church the quarry stones thinking this is something God's going to be proud of well he will be again because Lansdale Life Church is serving in there all week long isn't that awesome you know hearing with faith and just saying this seems like God I think he's doing something new I say we move forward and see what he has for us amen so let's give the Lord a round of applause and why don't we all stand up Lord God, we know you're speaking to us. We know there's something that you have planned for each one of us. And maybe we're stuck in a rut. Maybe we seem like we're held up from voices of the past, saying we can't do it. We're not talented enough. We're not good enough. We failed in the past. I don't have the money to do that. I don't have friends. I don't have whatever I think I don't have. The Lord says we will lack nothing. When we come to him with nothing, that's the best place to be, a poor spirit. So Lord God, we ask you to just purge us of the lies of the enemy, the fiery darts that keep telling us that we can't this and we can't that. We're not good enough. We don't measure up. Lord God, we know that we measure up to your stature when we believe everything that you're going to do in our lives. So, Lord God, we just surrender ourselves to you. We have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer we who live, but Christ who lives in us. And the life we now live in this flesh, we live in faith to the Son of God. Lord God, it's you living through us, not the past, Lord God. It's the newness of life. The same power that rose Christ from the dead has now risen us from the dead, Lord God. We walk in the newness of life. We walk into the promised land. You have given us a heart to perceive, Lord God. You have given us eyes to see and ears to hear the new truth, the new reality of our future. We see from your eyes, Lord God. May your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven, Lord God. We walk in the power and the stature of Jesus Christ, and no enemy can come against us, Lord God, because greater are you who are in us than he who is in the world. And Lord God, we are more than just conquerors. We are carriers of the Holy Spirit, temples of the Almighty God. We are royal priesthood. We are a holy nation. We are King of Kings, Lord God, because you are the royal King of all. We serve the King of Kings, and you call us your kings, Lord God. So Lord, we thank you that today is a new start. Whatever lies we're believing about ourselves are being purged right now. We're believing the truth in who you are, not who we were. So Lord God, just
just purge us of any doubt, purge us of any uh, loss or sickness and restore us to who you 